Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to church this evening. My name's Alex. A uh, particularly warm welcome to you if this is your first time at St. Luke's. Uh, here, our vision is to see people find new life in Christ and become wholehearted disciples of Him. Uh, we're continuing our series this evening uh, called Steadfast, where we've been taking a deep dive into the New Testament book of James, and we're thinking particularly tonight uh, about our speech and how we use our words. So let's stand and then use our words, our voices, to sing praise to God.
my name's Brett, I'm the Senior Minister here at St Luke's, really glad to be with you here tonight. Um, I'm getting up just a bit early in, in the service tonight to talk about uh, the next four weeks that are happening here at church. Uh, next four weeks at church are some of the most important weeks of our year because it's our annual pledging season. Uh, where myself and our parish council set the budget for 2024. And so to talk a bit about that, I've asked our church treasurer to come along tonight. Simon, do you want to come up? And if you're going to applaud anyone, you should have always applaud the church uh, treasurer. So thanks, Simon. Good to see you. Uh, if you've been around church for under a year, you kind of won't know what we're talking about when I say our pledging season. If you've been here for at least a year, you will have done this with us last year, which was the first time we ever tried to set our budget according to the pledges that people make. Um, but me and Simon have been sort of dreaming and scheming about this for a bunch of years before we actually did it. Uh, reason being is that we always set our church budget. Uh, everything that the church does is kind of uh, uh, like undergirded by the giving of the congregation and we used to set our church budget by thinking what did church give last year and what do you imagine they might give next year we kind of looked in a crystal ball a little bit and uh, imagined but we thought you know what our best guess is is not as good as your best guess like your best guess as to how much you're going to give next year is a way more accurate picture of how much we should set for our church budget and so we moved to a pledging system where over the course of four weeks, we asked everyone who's committed to life around here at St. Luke's uh, to write down anonymously what they think they'll give next year and to submit that to the church. And then we just took all those numbers and said, well, that's our budget. Um, Simon, we did it last year. We had our first go. How do you think we went? It, it was amazing. It was a lot less stress. Uh, as Brett said, it was not me sitting there going, this is what's happened in the past, looking through all the economic data to figure out how much wages have gone up and and what's happening with interest rates, it just meant that we were able to sit back with confidence, ask the congregation what they, what they think they'll be able to give, we take that number and then we can be able to work the budget from there. So it was, it was a lot less stress, it was a lot more confidence involved in the process, it was an amazing experience, and that is why we're back here again. We're gonna do it again because it was such a success last time. And so I think as well, uh, we're able to, and this is where the confidence came in, because of the confidence we had, we were able to support a couple of extra ministries uh, going forward. So there was definitely the things which I know some of you might have benefited from going to the LIT, the Leaders in Training at the beginning of the year. So we looked at that. Uh, we looked at the Shoalhaven um, Aboriginal Church, so there was that as well. And then there was Russell, which we were able to bring on. So there was a confidence piece that allowed Parish Council to be able to go where do we think, well, like, where do we think St Luke's is going next year? How can we support this with our money? And, um, and just be able to do that without having to worry about what the future may hold. Yeah, so as our budget increased because of our uh, pledging, we were able to create a really good partnership with the Shellhaven, Shellhaven Aboriginal Community Church. Uh, we were, if you went to LIT, chuck your hand up. Yeah, well, the guys, uh, our youngest leaders that we wanted to begin their leadership journey with really good training, we got to send them to LIT training camp. Uh, and then we got to think, uh, yeah, our big stretch goal for the year was could we bring someone on the staff team who will just take care of our church services? Uh, and wonderfully, we were able to do that, and we got to bring Russell on uh, in, that, in that profile here at church. So it was a fantastic moment to think, you know, when we ask the congregation to, uh, to pledge like this, we actually see new ministries uh, begin and ministries uh, begin to expand. Um, Simon, I'm assuming you pledged, kind of hoping you say yes. Yes. But yes, good. Okay, great. Um, you pledged last year. I imagine this scenario was sort of you with the little Veltmeyer children sitting around a fire. You're kind of telling them the importance of budgeting and all of that sort of stuff, like a good accountant that you are. Um, was that how it played out? How did you go about it? So it's, it's actually not too far off the truth. <laughs> um, I am an accountant, so it is a little bit of a formal occasion. Maybe not the fire, but we do sit down with our kids. I've got three kids. Uh, we do sit down with them around the dining room table. We talk to them about the importance of money, the importance of um, giving offertory as well. And we involve them in our decision making on offertory. And we also give some tax deductible giving to other things like universities and things like that. But we involve our kids. And the hope is that as they grow up through the church, this will be part of their normal uh, arrangements. This will be part of what they will seem as normal to be part of both pledging and an offertory. And so that's how we do. And then once we come to a number, there was a QR code on the, on the piece of form we had. It was a matter of scanning that, uh, typing the numbers in and pressing submit. So it was a very smooth process from our side of things. Yeah, right. You went QR code. I went for the actual pledge card. If, um, 
Uh, if you are someone who has given your details to church, if we have your address, you'll get one of these in the mail. If you don't get one in the mail, it means we don't have your right address, so get in touch with us. But I got my one for my letterbox, and uh, me and my wife sat down and we filled it out, because um, I don't like the QR code thing. You know at the restaurant when they say, yeah, just order on the QR code. I'm like, no, nah, man, I wanna, I'm going to look you in the eye and give you my order. Uh, so I liked a bit of paper, and we filled that out, and I put it in the pledge box up the back of, of church as well, as so many of us did. Um, yeah, and so we're asking everyone this year to, um, yeah, get around it again, to uh, be part of our pledging so that we can just set a really good budget for the year to come. Uh, it's our prayer that it'll go up and that we'll get to expand ministries again, and over the next few weeks I'll share with you some of the things that we would love to do if our budget um, is able to accommodate them. If you have any questions about uh, pledging, you can always talk to me about that. Uh, but a great place to go if you just want a bit more information than we've been able to share tonight is the newsletter that came out on Friday, heaps of information in there, or the letter that's coming to you in the mailbox, um, a lot of good information in there as well. Uh, but let me pray as we kick off our pledging season for the year. Let's pray. Our Lord and Father, you have been wonderfully uh, generous with us. Uh, you gave us your son, uh, that we may find life in him. Uh, Lord, and everything that we have, every blessing that we have is from you. Uh, and so, Father, we pray that we would have a wonderful time of personal discipleship over the next four weeks where we get to sit and look at our uh, income and think, yeah, this is all God's and all from him, and it's only right that I support the mission of Jesus uh, through my giving. Uh, we have a moment of, of putting our treasure somewhere and our heart following that. And we pray, Lord, that we would be filled with such generosity that uh, St. Luke's would be able to expand the ministry that it does in St. Luke's and the Shire and all around the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, thanks, everyone. And thanks, Simon, again. All right, we're going to have our Bible reading, so get those opened up. And Riley's going to come and read for us. Thanks, Riley. Tonight's Bible reading comes from James chapter 3, uh, verses, what's it, 1 to 18. Uh, pay, could be found on page 1723 of your Pew Bibles. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or we'll take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Oh, wait, no. Wait, is it? Hold on. 1 to 18. Keep going. Yeah, okay, cool. Sorry. <laughs> Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from the heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. There we go. Thanks, mate. Thanks for those few extra verses as well. Uh, all right. Hello again. Um, 
will say, if, if I've never met you before, I'd love to meet you after the service. And uh, if you haven't been around uh, St. Luke's over the last term, we've been working through the letter of James. Uh, we're not randomly jumping into chapter 3. It just happens to be where we're up to. But let's pray, then we'll have a look at these verses. Uh, Lord and Father, we thank you for your, uh, your scriptures, uh, your word to us in the Bible. We thank you for how much it transforms our hearts and our lives when we submit to it, uh, when we obey it, when we love it. And uh, yeah, we pray that tonight, by your Holy Spirit's uh, kindness to us, you might be uh, yeah, just laying these words upon our hearts uh, once again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, I'm going to put a word up on the screen. I do not know how to pronounce it. You are going to have a go at pronouncing it. Why don't you turn to the person beside you, tell me what you reckon this means, but have a, have a practice first of all. <laughs> all right, enough, 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 enough. Knock it off. Anyone want to shout out what they think this word, how to say it? To loungephobia. It has the word lounge in it, which makes me think it's got to say to loungephobia. So I'm up for that. Uh, anyone want to, want to have a go at what they think it is? It is a phobia, by the way, what they think it is a phobia of. Phobia of the tongue. Phobia of the tongue. Who said that? Tim. <laughs> Check out the big brain on Tim. It is, my friend. It is. Uh, this is a persistent and abnormal fear of the tongue. Halangiophobia. Anyone got it? Okay, good. Um, the plan is, though, uh, although none of us have it, that we will leave here with a little bit of it at least. Uh, James is very interested in laying upon us in this uh, chapter, which is part of a letter he wrote to the early Christian churches, uh, that they should have a, a very, very healthy respect, if not a fear, of the tongue and the awesome power of it. Here's verse 6 from our chapter. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Uh, lots of us have probably been pretty in awe of the wildfires that have broken out on Maui and in Greece recently, great walls of flame. And considering where we live and where we holiday, uh, many of us will have been up close and personal with the Australian bushfires that we have during summer. I want you to imagine that you catch one of your friends at the height of summer uh, beside the bushland in Australia flicking matches into the bush. Like you would be rightly horrified, wouldn't you? You'd scream at them in fear because you know that every one of the fires that have ever ravished Australia has been lit, in, lit by just one spark. Just one flame is enough to light a huge fire. And that instinctive fear that we have of someone uh, lighting a fire in our, in our land, a uh, similar fear James wants to lay upon us, uh, God wants to lay upon us, in the power that the tongue has to light fires in communities and amongst people. Uh, and the particular fires that he speaks of are the fires of hell. It's as if James is saying, you realise what your tongue can do. You know that loveless, godless, uh, joyless place, hell? Your tongue can actually bring it here and let it loose amongst us. We're going to work through our passage today, knowing that that's where James is going. Uh, and so we'll start at chapter 3, verse 1. I hope you've got your Bible still open, looking at it as I, as I work my way through this. And the first tongue that James wants you to have a pretty decent fear of is actually mine. Okay, let's read this together. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers. And that uh, word in the original, in the Greek, was my... Brothers, uh, they, these are the, the men that James writes to, first of all, are the, are the people who are leading the early churches. So not many of you who lead these churches should become teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. James puts himself in this category of teacher. He's writing to other people who are, maybe are thinking about becoming teachers or, or who are already teachers of the church. And he says, not many of you should do that because you know you will be judged more strictly than the people you are teaching. The passage has much to say to all of us about our words, but it's going, going to begin with my words as someone who has become a teacher of the church. Uh, James writes to people like me and says, you should be awfully careful assuming your role as teacher 
over a church community, you'll be judged more strictly. Uh, remember the context that James is writing into. Uh, the church, very early on in its life after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus, uh, has been driven out of Jerusalem through persecution. The first martyrs there in Jerusalem, and after that, the church is scattered out to Judea and Samaria. Uh, there they are, these groups of Christians start to band together and people would have become leaders over these groups of Christians and teachers over these groups of Christians. And these are the people that are guiding the church in how they are to respond when they're, when they're attacked, when they're persecuted, when they're hunted by men like Saul, when they're dragged into court and unfairly treated by the Roman government. How should they respond uh, are leaders leading them towards Christ-likeness in those moments or towards violence, political games, favoritism of the rich to see them through this time of persecution? Uh, James addresses these teachers. How are you leading the church to respond to the persecution? Uh, I want to say that teaching through the New Testament, uh, it's addressed an awful lot, and a lot of the time in the New Testament, teaching is this really flat, egalitarian, everyone gets in on it kind of activity in church life. Uh, you read in, a, in the New Testament that everyone should be teaching one another through psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, right? So the first two songs we sang tonight, that was everyone teaching each other certain truths, uh, sharing the psalms and sharing the scriptures with each other. We all get to do that. It's not just one person. Uh, probably some of the most important teaching that's going to happen tonight will happen down in the courtyard after church at supper where you share your life with someone and they have some wisdom to pour into that and you will teach one another. So sometimes it's a very flat, everyone gets in on it sort of activity and at the same time, it's a very restricted activity in the New Testament. You have like little t teaching, we might say, that everyone's in on, and then you have these very serious moments, capital T teaching, where someone gets up in front of the gathered believers and says, this is what God says. And James is addressing the people who get to do that and making sure they understand the incredible gravity of the position that they are in. He urges these brothers, these leaders of the churches, uh, to uh, not to jump into the role of teaching too quickly because they're going to be judged with greater strictness than the people that they teach. Why is that? And the answer to that is in verse 2, so keep looking. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. What's the body here, if James is addressing teachers of the gathered church, if they are the tongue, what's the body? Uh, I think the body he speaks of is the gathered body of Christ. And so the, the greater strictness that these teachers are judged with is because of the relationship between their words and the body. And that if they keep their words in check, then the body of believers will similarly be kept in check. They will be well guided. They'll be well guided in, in, particularly here, the response they will make to persecution that they face. But if they stumble, as so many of us do in many ways, uh, then so too the church will stumble because of the words of the leader. And those whom Jesus died for might be led towards ruin by careless words or cowardly words. And this is why the teacher is judged with greater strictness here in James. And James gives us a couple of images uh, of the power of the words of a, of a church teacher over the rest of the church. Uh, his, two, his two pictures that are there in verse 3. Uh, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. So horses and ships are the two images he wants to give us. Uh, we're going to go for a different horse than that one. Go for this horse. Uh, so imagine a horse, okay? Incredibly powerful animal in the ancient world, able to do great good. With a horse, 
Uh, You can carry the sick with a horse. You can plow a field and feed the hungry with a horse. You can take a great journey and take the message of Jesus somewhere. Horses are amazing, and they are just steered by that bit, that bit of metal in their mouths. But at the same time, that bit could take a horse, which is capable of great good, and steer it to charge and attack their enemy. Into battle goes the horse. Uh, Likewise, a ship capable of great good in the ancient world. With a ship, you can bear food to the hungry and distant lands. You can go on great journeys to explore with a ship. Uh, You can sail uh, onto the seas that God has made. And also, with the same rudder that can steer you on all of those wonderful directions, that same rudder could steer that ship to invade the land of an enemy. And here is a picture, again, that James has been developing of the power of the church teacher over the body. Uh, The church teacher could urge the body of believers, hey, we're about looking after orphans and widows, we're about humility and gentleness and grace. The teacher is a small mouthpiece, but it's able to guide uh, the body of believers in those directions. But likewise, uh, that teacher could do great damage to a church and guide them into something else altogether. And I think that's the situation James addresses. Uh, How are these church leaders guiding the church? Have a look at verse 9. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Uh, There's a picture of how the church leaders are using their tongues, using the fact that they can stand before the church. They're using it to curse others. And we've got to think in terms of the first century. What's a curse in the first century? It's not just like swearing at someone out the window of your car. It's actually putting a curse on them and trying to predict and decide what their future is going to hold and to to make their future hold great hurt and damage against them. Teachers using curses against people made in the image of God. Enemies of the church, maybe, but nonetheless made in the image of God. Or again, have a look at verse 6. We had this verse before. Uh, The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, is itself set on fire by hell. Our leaders using their words to incite the passion and the anger and the rage and the revenge of their congregations. Their own tongue set on fire. And so setting on fire the the people they're supposed to be guiding towards peace. Church leaders, fiery words, corrupting the whole body. Uh, That's the scene here, I think, in chapter 3 of James. We'll take a moment now just to think how these verses that largely do address church leaders might apply to us more broadly in church. Uh, I do want you to know that I have um, sat on this all week and really felt the weight of them for me because... James says, not many of you should uh, become teachers. And I'm like, too late, mate. (laughs) Decision's made, I'm stuck in it now. Uh, And so this weighs on me to think that my own words, whether they be careless or cowardly, uh, here at St. Luke's, I will be judged more strictly than you for them. Uh, But what about for all of us? Uh, What about for all of us? What do these words teach us? And I I think, first of all, they're a really important moment for uh, you and I to consider who it is we put in the role of teacher in our life, knowing that those who have the role of teacher in our life also have the ability to steer us in particular directions. I think this topic was something that Paul addresses too in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He says these words, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine, Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. I don't know what Paul was imagining was coming, why he said a time will come when people will gather around them teachers that will tell them exactly what they want to hear. Uh, I don't know how far into the future he was looking, but certainly uh, he could have applied that to our modern times, where on every single media platform that you have available to you, you will certainly find a teacher who will say exactly what your ears want to hear. Uh, That is the reality of the life and the world that we live in. There are many, many voices. 
Uh, and if we go about hearing teaching like we go about shopping at the supermarket, going down the aisle and finding the thing that particularly appeals to our taste, you could very easily find yourself surrounding your life with teachers who are only ever telling you exactly what you want to hear. It's all manner of things in the Bible that I find very hard to hear. What the Bible has to say about what I do with my money. Hard to hear. What the Bible says I should do with my priorities. What should be first in my life. Hard to hear when I want it to be me. What the Bible says about human sexuality. What the Bible says about men and women. Uh, what the Bible says about sin and its impacts, what the Bible says about judgment and about hell, all sorts of things in the Bible that I sort of recoil at a little bit. I don't always want to hear these things. Uh, Then again, I didn't write it. God did, and I'm not him. And so I would expect to find in the Scriptures many things that I find personally difficult, but that will be changing me and transforming me and preparing me for the day I stand before God. But the reality is, on each of those topics, if you want, you could find a teacher who will teach you what you want to hear about them, uh, that will sound good to you, that will be easier to hear for you. Uh, They might be just totally separate from the church, just pop culture, prophets, celebrities. Well, that could very easily be someone who says, hey, I'm teaching you the Bible here, though it sounds nothing like the Bible, though it's not what anyone said about the Bible for 2,000 years. I I promise you I'm teaching it, trust me. And it's a good moment uh, as we look at James here to have a think about the teachers we have installed around us and to ask hard questions of them and to say, are they actually guiding me towards Jesus? And are they really urging costly obedience to Jesus? Or are they urging something else? And if I were to allow them to be the rudder of my life, for them to steer me in the direction they want, would it lead to a life where I glorify God in my words and my actions? Would they actually be able to do that for me? Or are they doing something else? And to be truly fearful of their words and think, these words could, they could bring hell here. That's the power of anyone's words. And are these people that I have allowed to be teachers in my life actually bringing those flames here that might feel warm at first, but I do risk having them consume me? Uh, I think that might be the first way this passage could be applied into our lives. Uh, But I want to go on and think not just about the words that we're hearing, the words that we allow to teach us, but also the words that we say. Uh, Might this passage have anything to teach us about the words that we say and that we share with other people? And I think it definitely does. Uh, Very few of us in the room will find ourselves in that uh, terrible position of being a capital T teacher of the church. Uh, But all of us we'll have spaces in our life where our words have influence over others. And it might be uh, for those married in the room, in your marriages, whether you're a husband or a wife, your words will have incredible influence over the other, able to guide them, able to steer them. Uh, For those with families in the room, your words will have great power in those families. Uh, In your workplace, Your words will have influence over some people, Uh, some of us greater, some of us less, but all of us will have spaces where our words have influence in our friendship groups massively, in in the crew we hang out with at church or at uni, in our Bible study groups, in our youth groups, amongst the kids we lead on Sunday. In all these spaces, your words will act like something like a rudder, steering people and groups of people in different directions. It's pretty big power that we have, having heard here the power that our words do have. And you might think on one hand, James seems like really pessimistic about our ability to say anything good in these spaces. Have a look at verse 7 and 8. All kinds of animals and birds and reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. 
my first reaction to that verse is wondering exactly what sea creatures were being tamed at the time, kind of these like, Jerusalem Bible, uh, sorry, Jerusalem kind of dolphin shows or something like that going on. Uh, but it's a pretty pessimistic verse, no human being can tame the tongue. You might say back to James at this point, well, what are we all bothering doing here? If it's all done and dusted. Uh, James does think we can tame the tongue, though. It's just not that you do it by yourself. Uh, keep going down, we'll go all the way down to the bottom of the chapter, verse 17. I read these verses. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is, first of all, pure then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Uh, The wisdom that comes from heaven, this thing, this wisdom that comes from heaven leads to a sort of speech and sort of life that is pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, that is a tamed tongue. And this wisdom from heaven, as in in the book of James, is Jesus. He's the sort of embodied wisdom that comes from the Father to us. And you can hear James here pretty well quoting Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are the meek, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure in heart. They are all the things that James says is the wisdom from heaven. They are the words that Jesus spoke. It's the life that Jesus led. And they're ours, that wisdom is ours as we're bound to Jesus by faith, as we trust him, and as he shares his spirit with us and transforms us more and more to be like him. That is, when it comes to taming your tongue, which James says, look, no human being can do it, his point is, no human being is going to need to do it themselves if they have received the wisdom that is from heaven, if they've received Jesus as their king. No human being can tame the tongue, but with the divine son, says James, with this wisdom from heaven, you can make a pretty good start of it. And I want us to end on seeing the impact that having a tongue that's tamed by Jesus can have. Verse 18, our final verse there, uh, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. A harvest of righteousness something that the Old Testament prophets spoke about. It wasn't a personal righteousness, first of all. It was a world set right. That's what they were hoping for in the future, praying for, that God would return to them and there would be a harvest of righteousness. The world would be set right again. And James says, guess what? That happens as peacemakers sow in peace. They sow their words in peace. And those words, sown like seeds, that is where righteousness will grow from. So you get these two images in chapter 3 of James, both of them of, of things that start small but eventually grow big. The beginning is the warning, the small spark that sets a great fire. And it ends with a small seed that grows into a great harvest of righteousness. And they're really perfect images for James because can't our words do the same thing? And don't, isn't this the function of the, our words in our lives? Uh, sowing those impartial, considerate, peaceful, merciful words is frustratingly slow work and it doesn't seem to make any changes in our world. Uh, I remember... Um, I think I've told this story before, but one year in spring looking at my a terrible backyard, my awful lawn, and going, I'm going straight to Bunnings, I'm going to buy a bunch of rolls of turf, it's going to be that good stuff, that Sir Walter, the expensive stuff, I'm going to get it. Took my car down to Bunnings, had a look at the price of these things, started tallying it up, came home with a bag of seeds. And I took those seeds and I spread them over my backyard, and you know what they did? Nothing. Just, they would not grow. Desperate as I was to see a lawn grow up, they just would not do it. And James chooses that image for sowing words of peace into the world. And I think it's great because it is such a frustratingly slow work. There's people round on you in anger. You sow words of kindness and mercy. Uh, as, as, As people hurt you, you don't then go to that next thing and try to destroy their reputation by gossip. And you, you speak in these ways, 
and it doesn't seem to do anything. And so that's why we revert back to the other type of words, the words that do seem to have an impact, that do seem to make some changes in the world. You know, when we lie, we tend to advance forward. Our reputation is better, protected, makes a difference. Uh, those people that do hurt us to, to gossip behind their back and cut out their reputation, that makes changes, it, it turns people against them like we want. Uh, to shout at our husband, to, to speak contemptuously to our wife. We, we do these things to try and create a world that we want, to try and make that person change, to belittle our children or uh, say terrible things to our parents. We're trying to affect change on, in the world and so often it's those sorts of words that do a quick work, that we see some sort of impact straight away. And James is saying here, yeah, but... It's, it's the lighting of fires that you're seeing. It's the lighting of fires, and it's not bringing the harvest of righteousness, it's bringing hell here. And instead, you need to do the slow work, the, the, the seed-sowing work, and it won't make changes straight away, and it might frustrate you as an impact isn't made, but James promises it is only through that that a harvest of righteousness will grow, that the world will actually eventually be set to rights through communities of God's people who are so living in faith in Jesus that they will speak as he calls them to speak, as slow as that work is. All right, we're going to take a moment now. I'll ask the band to come up. I'm going to invite you to spend some time in prayer. And lots of us may be thinking of the words that we've said over the past week, wondering whether we brought hell here or whether we were creating a harvest of righteousness here. But I want you to also not just dwell on the sins of the week past, uh, being that we have a king in Jesus who forgives us the sins we've committed and who invites us to rise again in repentance and look to the future again. And so I invite you to think through the words you're going to say, uh, not back then, but from this point on, uh, and to commit ourselves again to uh, sowing the seeds of righteousness uh, through speech controlled by Jesus. Uh, so, yeah, in a moment, uh, the band will invite you to stand, but, uh, yeah, take some time in prayer now. and pleads for me. My name is Grace. 
please pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for defeating the curse of sin and death for us through the death of your Son. Lord, we bring before you those who are sick or recovering from illness or injury. Lord, may you hold your sustaining hand over them and bring them back to full health soon. Father, we pray for, the, pray for those caring them, for them, that they can be patient and full of love, and that they can be assisting them to get through the day. Lord, as we grow weary waiting for the redemption of our bodies, we thank you that there is hope through frustration and hardship, and that we can look to you in prayer. Father, we give thanks for our link missionaries, David and Catherine Lewis, with Reuben and Felix, and for their work with AFES at Geelong Christian Union at Deakin University. Father, we thank you for the number of students they have been connecting with recently after the beginning trimester two, launching a mission campaign called The Time of Our Lives. We also give thanks for the number of international, Catholic and Muslim students coming along. Thank you, God, for the excitement this brings, and we ask you for your spirit to be present during these times. We pray for their upcoming event during week five titled Identity and Time, can sexuality and gender change. Lord, we pray for the students inviting their friends for the sensitive subject and that it can spark some good conversations. We also pray for the student leadership as it seeks for new students to train for serving you, God. Lord, please give those wisdom who are choosing and approaching new leaders and that they can be choosing well. Father, we pray for the Lewis family as they are nearing Dave's long service leave. We pray for their preparations and for them to be excited for their road trip as a family and that they can have good quality time together. Lord, we now pray for the conflict in Ukraine and that you could be protecting the Christians and that in the midst of, the, of a war that they can be looking to Jesus for deliverance. We also pray for the over 60,000 people who have died and that those mourning for them can also be looking to you, Lord. Father, we now pray that we can be encouraged and changed by today's sermon and that we can take what we've learnt home and implement it into our daily lives. Lord, we thank you for the book of James and our series theme, Steadfast, looking at how we remain steadfast as a church, God's people, no matter what is going on in the world around us. Lord, we pray that in our works and deeds, we can be humble, considerate, submissive, merciful, impartial, sincere and seek peace. Father, we pray for those in leadership positions in our church, that they can be modelling these words and deeds for us at St Luke's. Lord, we pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Uh, friends, before we sing our final song, just a few uh, moments of what's going on in life around here at our church. Uh, the first one is that we're a church that longs to uh, involve and welcome and care for uh, all people. Uh, and one of the ways that we're doing that is through our accessibility survey. Uh, and so we would love for you to fill one of those out. Uh, they're uh, in paper copy up the back. They're, you can also scan the QR code. We want to make uh, this church and this space a place that everyone is welcomed and able and accessible to reach. Uh, so, yeah, do fill that out. We would love for you to help us and help our accessibility committee as they spend time uh, working that out for what, working out what that looks like for us. Um, also, uh, coming out of em our Embodied series uh, last term, uh, one of the questions we had was about transgender identity in the church. And so a guy called Rob Smith, uh, he's a lecturer at SNBC, has just recently written a PhD in a book on this topic. He's going to come and speak to us. Uh, it's on this Tuesday night at 7.30 p.m. up here at church. Uh, there'll be opportunity for him to uh, share uh, what it looks like for us as a church, but also opportunity for us to ask questions. Uh, so please do uh, come along with your Bible study uh, to that Tuesday night. Uh, coming up also for our young adults uh, is a thing called Young Adults Big Day In. Uh, it's going to be here at church all day on September the 9th. Be a bunch of games and community uh, and also a talk from Lee Murray uh, talking about sanctification in the Christian life. Uh, it looks really, really great. Uh, you should come along. There's lunch and dinner. It's 30 bucks. Uh, please do sign up for that. Our uh, last one whilst our band comes back up. Uh, if you are a kid in year three to five, which most of you aren't, but if you have children in uh, years three to five, uh, a thing called Square One is coming up. I like to think of it as like the great escape for kids. Uh, it's a couple day camp, uh, it's at YouthWorks. Uh, tickets sell out really, really fast, so please do jump on, sign up for it, sign your kids up for it. 
uh, it's a great moment for them to uh, do exactly what the theme of the, uh, their kids' week a weekend away is, is being transformed by grace. Uh, what a good uh, thing for them to spend time in, to invite them along to. Uh, but we're going to stand now and uh, sing our final song. So would you stand and let's sing. to know a little bit more about uh, who Jesus is or you've been asking the question, what is life really all about? We'd like to invite you along to our Explore Life series where we discuss what's the good life uh, and what does Jesus have to offer. We meet here on Mondays at 7pm in the Fellowship Centre, so if you'd like to join us, please scan the QR code or speak to a welcomer on your way out of the service this evening. Uh, also, if you're relatively new to St. Luke's, we'd like to invite you along to Onboard, which is a relaxed meal uh, where we can get to know you and you can hear some from our staff at St. Luke's uh, and learn a little bit more about what we have to offer here at St. Luke's. Uh, it's on the 10th of September for lunch or dinner, so please uh, come along to that and talk to a welcome or someone you've seen up the front uh, this evening if you'd like a bit more information. Uh, well, Brett's reminded us tonight uh, to reflect critically on who the leaders are in our lives. Um, these leaders that we've installed in their lives, are they urging us towards costly submission uh, in line with what Jesus has to say? Or are they more encouraging and confirming some messages that we want to hear? Uh, we've also been encouraged tonight to uh, imagine what a world would look like where our tongues were tamed, uh, a world of peacemakers who sow in peace and reap a plentiful harvest. Let me pray for us. Uh, Father, your word is wonderful and true. Aid us to remember the power of our words uh, while seeing the harvest may be slow. Help us to be considerate, submissive, peacemaking, pure, impartial and serene and sincere in our words. Uh, let our words be guided well by Jesus. 
Uh, well, that brings us to the end of our service this evening. Uh, please uh, come down to the courtyard and join us for supper.